good afternoon. Uh, it, it's really a pleasure to be here to, to present something from my project on populism that might be perhaps relevant to the project here at the University of, um, of uh, Coimbra. So the title of my presentation is Can Direct Democracy and Deliberative Mini Publics Address the Challenge of Populism? So I first start by giving a couple of well, definitions. Uh, we all may think to know what populism is, but actually there's a big literature uh, on what is actually populism and how to define it. So I'm not going to, um, to, to, to sum up that, that, that uh, literature, uh, but just to let you know what I have in mind when I when I uh, say populism. So I use a minimalist definition uh, of uh, populism on which I think there is some kind of a more or less uh, broad uh, <coughs> consensus in the, liter uh, in, the, in the literature, which is to say that in order to speak of a populist movement, populist leader, populism as a phenomenon, you need these two core elements. Uh, there is this anti-elitist part, so usually populist movements, rhetoric, etc., is against the elites, economical, political, etc., elites. But that's not sufficient. You need also the second element, uh, which is this anti-pluralism. Anti-pluralism mm -hmm. means that populists have a, a unified, homogeneous idea of the people. They, they speak of the people as if it were a homogeneous unity. And they don't allow for pluralism within that people, which is actually very important for the concept of democracy. So, as I, as I put on the second uh, point here, populism is not necessarily bad. Uh, you know, there are people who say, well, actually, it's good to have populist movements because they give voice to people who are other, uh, to, to citizens who otherwise do not feel represented by traditional parties. It's better that these people have at least one party with which to identify, then no party at all, etc., etc. But generally speaking, it says that the combination of this anti-elitism, which is also per se not something that can be actually very positive in democracy, uh, but it's this combination of anti-elitism and anti-pluralism which is problematic for liberal democracy and can potentially be dangerous or bear some risks for democracy. If <coughs> populists take power uh, and, and they have this anti-pluralist, non-pluralist conception of the people, well, it can degenerate. Uh, uh, we have some examples uh, also in the current politics, uh, Hungary, for instance, etc. Uh, so, yes, when I speak about populism, this is what I have in mind. And generally speaking, when, when we say that there is, uh, in the past years, uh, all around Europe, uh, even in this country, a rise of populist movements, it is often connected with the idea that we live in, a, in, a, in an era where uh, uh, democracy, as we knew democracy, is in crisis. What is this crisis of democracy? Well, many things, but let's say uh, one thing is that the, uh, the turnout in election in many countries uh, drops. Uh, the, uh, the traditional political parties, as we know, as we have known them in in, in many countries, uh, are experiencing big, big uh, changes, reforms, and, and some of them are even disappearing from the from the from the political scene. Uh, think only of France. The, the the two main French parties, you know, that were really dominant uh, in France for many, many decades. Uh, uh, Socialist Party and you know, on the right, the Republican Party, they almost disappeared in the last presidential elections. Their candidates received, I think, less than 5% of the vote. Uh, we can also think of Italy, what happened to the Italian political system already since the early 90s. To, uh, even in Germany, you know, Christian Democrats are at, at the lowest level since the Second World War, etc. Et so, there is this crisis of democracy. Populism, and linked with with this uh, development, there is uh, a quest for more direct democracy. When I say quest, it means that you have 
scholars who, who, who write about that, but you have actually uh, a lot of um, political parties all around Europe that demand more direct democracy. So what do, we, what do I mean when I say direct democracy? Again, you can have many de definitions, but in, in a few words, what I don't have in mind is, is the ancient Greek style of direct democracy where people would gather on the square and deliberate and take decisions. Uh, at least that's what we think uh, was the case in, in, in the Athens. We don't know all the details, but that's the idea of this direct democracy. Now, what I have in mind is a direct democracy that does not you know, eliminate institutions of representative democracy and mechanisms of representative democracy like elections, but is complementary to it. So you still have parliament, government, elections, but you also have uh, the possibility to have popular votes on referendums or also on popular or citizens initiatives. So typically referendum, again, there are differences from country to country uh, where you have referendums, but like in Switzerland, country I uh, live and work, referendum is the word to say when the parliament has made a decision, a new law or has reformed a law, uh, citizens have the possibility to collect signatures within a certain span of time. In Switzerland it's 50,000 signatures during 100 days, 50,000 it corresponds to 1% of the electoral body, so it's not too much, uh, but it's also, you know, it's not so easy to collect 50,000 signatures, so you do need some effort. Uh, and then, in the end, the people decide whether or not they agree with that law or not. Popular initiative, or also co called sometimes citizens' initiative, is when citizens start a given reform by collecting signatures uh, and proposing something themselves. In this case, in the Swiss system, you need 100,000 signatures, but you have more time, you have 18 months in order to collect signatures for a popular initiative. And then, again, Parliament can say, and government, what do they think about this popular initiative, that do they accept or not? If they don't accept it, then, again, there is a popular vote, and uh, citizens who uh, turn out and vote, uh, a majority decides. So, so, so this is what I, th what I have in mind when I say direct democracy. Okay, now that we have, I hope, clarified the two main um, concepts here, populism and, and direct democracy. Let's see how do they connect. And here we, we have a puzzle. A puzzle meaning that uh, most literature, I think mainly of literature of democratic theory, but also empirical political science, uh, authors like Sartori, Rubinati, both Italians, Cristiano, our Cristiano, another an American, Thomas Cristiano, etc., Philip Pettit, uh, and other scholars, they are very much uh, skeptical or sometimes even against direct democracy. For many reasons, they fear uh, tyranny of majority, they think uh, you know, democracy cannot be simply you know, summed up to, to say yes or no to something. You, you know, there are also shades of gray, and there's a um, uh, you need deliberation for many reasons. I, if you want, I, we can, we can, we can uh, develop them uh, more. But just to say that there's actually very, very, you will find very, very few democratic theorists who, who are in favor of direct democracy. And another reason to be, to think that direct democracy actually is something that enables populism. Uh, is that populists themselves, pop, uh, populist parties themselves, and, and leaders and movements, they demand more direct democracy. You can see this in France with Rassemblement National, with uh, Austria, Germany, AfD, the UK, uh, the, the UK party. Uh, I think even in Chega in, in Portugal has have, have made some. Um, I just, I was searching this morning, I found a, a news from August 2020 that uh, some people from Chega were demanding a referendum to introduce that death penalty, etc., etc. So, so basically these two 
and you know, populists themselves, these scholars, and I should also add, you know, politicians generally, politicians from traditional political parties, they are typically against direct democracy. Uh, uh, and and uh, yes, there is this idea that direct democracy means opening windows and doors to populism, and thus this is something uh, to be prevented. So basically, my thesis that I try to defend is, uh, well, against the current, if I may say so, uh, saying that uh, direct democracy can uh, be not necessarily favorable to populism. Uh, to the contrary, I even think that it can, it can be one of the instruments to well, fight this bad populism. Again, you might have some good populism, but these, these dangers of populism. So this is, a, again, not a, a mainstream thesis, so I'm trying to defend a thesis that, is a, that goes against but there are some preconditions before I explain why do I think that our democracy is not necessarily enabling for populism. Uh, first, the kind of direct democracy that I have in mind is a bottom-up direct democracy, not top-down. So it's not as in France, as in the UK, that the president or prime minister decides, let's hold the referendum. That's top-down. No, bottom-up is as I said uh, a few minutes ago, it's important or actually necessary to collect signatures. You need an effort from citizens to collect signatures in order to launch a referendum or to launch a citizens' initiative, uh, which means that actually citizens themselves have the ability to influence the agenda of the parliament or of the government, depending on what kind of uh, political system you have. Then it's also important that this collection of signatures actually has an importance, has a real power, power to, to see that referendum or initiative actually organized in a popular vote, so that there is a vote on that, and, and, and that this vote has some consequences. So this is to say that I don't have in, what I don't uh, have in mind when I when I speak about direct democracy is, for instance, a European Citizens Initiative. European Citizens Initiative, you know, may know, perhaps not. It's something that has been introduced by the Treaty of Lisbon, 2009, I think, allowing one million of European citizens uh, from at least eight countries. So it, it, they must be signatures must come from at least eight countries uh, to well. Uh, have a given uh, citizens' initiative uh, on the table. European Commission and the European Parliament must say what do they think about this proposal, but in the end, if they simply say, okay, we don't agree, for these are these reasons, but we don't agree, that stops the process. So there is no popular vote. You, I, I, you know, we have never experienced a popular vote at the level of the European Union. And I think this is this is problematic because this means basically that the, you know, the, the instrument is not really used that much because you need a huge effort of citizens, of course, it's not only simply citizens, sometimes it's trade unions or some social movements, etc., who, who start the collection of signatures. You, know, you need a lot of effort, people, money, etc. You have these million signatures and then in the end, European Parliament and Commission say, okay, thank you, bye-bye. So, no, in, in, in my view, you need to have a popular vote. Also, if the hurdles for the referendum are, are not too high, remember I said in Switzerland it's 1% of more or less, so it's not defined by percentage, but 50,000 50, people correspond to more or less 1% of the electorate. Uh, well, that's a uh, you know, hurdle, but still, it's, you, can, you can do it. If you raise that already to 5%, so it's, it's in the Swiss case it would be 250,000, well, it would be much more difficult. And if you have like 20%, well, then forget about it. That's, for instance, something you have in France. Uh, in France, uh, at regional and municipal level, depending, they have the possibility, 20% of citizens to launch a referendum, but basically it's almost never used. 
And when is it used? It's only it has only this kind of uh, power of uh, uh, in the, the the government is not or municipal authority or regional. They are not obliged to 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 follow what the decision has been. So it's maybe it's, it's more consultative. But this means that for these reasons, referendums are almost never used uh, in France at the, at the sub-national level. And as I said, at the national level, it's, it's typically the president who decides. Recently, they introduced some reforms that the parliament can also decide. But it's been uh, at least, I think, 17 years, more or less, since the last referendum in France on, on, the, on the European Constitution. So not too high hurdles means that you have frequent referendums. Not once every 10, 20 years, but frequent. Typically, a, number, a couple of referendums every year. And then you need also occasions for deliberation before the popular vote. So it's not simply that you bring people and say, OK, say yes or no, and that's it. No. You need discussions before uh, in the parliament, but also uh, in public, public debates, in the newspapers and the media. Etc. Etc. So that that in the end, it, it you know people who vote they know what they are voting about. So, if these preconditions are met, there is now a couple of arguments that I want to put forward as arguments uh, that well I hope sustain this thesis that direct democracy is not necessarily populist. Actually, it can can have a um, um, yeah, it can be anti populist as well. First is this idea of winners and losers, very important. If you have a frequent use of direct democracy, a lot of popular votes, this means that in every occasion you will have a majority and minority. But very important is that you it's, it's practically never the same majority and the same minority. Every voter in, a, in, such a, in such a system is sometimes in the majority, sometimes in minority. And this is very important because uh, you know, mainstream theorists of democracy see this as a disadvantage of direct democracy. You know, it doesn't, you know, you don't have a clear government, you know, I mean, you do have government, but then if you have all these majorities and minorities that change from referendum to referendum, then you know they fear instability and this and this kind of things. Whereas uh, in, in 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 my account of uh, of, of this uh, non-populist direct democracy, this aspect is very important because this means that you will have members of minorities. Minorities can be political minorities, can be also linguistic minorities, religious minorities, etc. People who belong to these minorities who sometimes will be in minority in referendums, but in other, you know, in other referendums they will be in, in a majority. And this is something that breaks structurally, I would say, this populist idea of a homogeneous people of a, you know, uh, uh, that has a, a clear single political will. Because simply, this is, again, impossible if you have a lot of, uh, lot of referendums. This is also something that, uh, that can be connected to the concept of loser's consent in, um, in certain theories of, of democracy. It's often said that loser's consent is important for stability of democracy. It's, imp it's important that those who lose the elections, let's forget about referendums now, but those who lose the elections must accept it because they know, perhaps in four or five years, depending on the electoral cycle, uh, they might be in majority and they might win the election. So this loser's consent is important to provide democracy with stability. And if we think of that, we can say that there are indeed empirical studies that show that in places with a lot of direct democracy, uh, you have a higher levels of citizen satisfaction with that democracy. Uh, and, and it can help 
to close this gap between winners and losers. Because again, if you have a lot of referendums, remember this frequent use of direct democracy, it means that, you know, I, I lose on this referendum, but I know, and I, I consent, you know, I say, okay, I accept, because I know in a few months there will be another referendum, and in that case I might be in majority. And actually, if I am in a majority, well, that supports uh, the idea that I should, you know, accept the results of a referendum where I was in my minority, and so, and so on. Yes, so, the, the argument number one to, to I, mean, I made some theoretical premises in order to come to this argument number one, is to say that a frequent and regular use of direct democracy structurally, structurally undermines populist ideology, which is based on the idea that there is a people's will, and, and, and an, on a, it, it is based on an idea of a unified, non-pluralist concept, conception of the people. Again, we know that this conception is, is a fiction, but I claim, or I argue, that it is easier to unmask this rhetor populist rhetoric in a political system in which direct democracy is frequently used and in which it produces multiple majorities and minorities. Second, uh, direct democracy also enhances the formation of a demos. So I sometimes, you know, we prefer to, speak, to say of demos instead of people, because people, you know, sometimes has populist connotations, does not, does not need to, but sometimes it does have this connotation. So demos is a, well, political community of citizens. And uh, it's said that it's important, again, for stable democracy, that this demos, uh, uh, that the people, the individuals who compose, citizens who compose the demos, that they share some, some common identity. Because it's often said, especially in multi-ethnic societies, divided societies, etc., that if you don't have a, some kind of common identity of people who perhaps speak different languages, belong to different religious groups, etc., well, you have a problem because you need some, at least thin, identification with a, with a common Identity. And, and one, one argument here is that um, the, the direct democracy is, is, is something that can en enhance the formation of this demos. I developed these ideas about 10 years ago. But to connect them now to the question of, 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 um, of populism, the idea is that this kind of demos that, that direct democracy brings about is not, again, the unified, non-pluralist people that populist rhetoric um, uh, speaks about, but rather a plural, plural political community that societies do need in order to uh, have a functioning democracy. For some of you who are familiar with the work of the French uh, philosopher Claude Lefort, the idea is that uh, uh, this conception uh, of people is closer to his idea uh, when he says that in a democratic regime the people is multiple and he says uh, in French, infigurable, so you cannot, you know, figure it out as, as, as a homogeneous thing. It's, it's, it's a multiple. It's, it's a multiple thing. And this is, again, not what populists have in mind when they speak about the people. So, of course, uh, as in, uh, in any uh, uh, real-world representative democracy, but also in theory of representative democracy. Think of Federalist Papers, uh, the late 18th century, uh, so American Constitution, etc. Well, they said, okay, let's introduce elections and, 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 and this idea to, that you need the consent of citizens in order to have a government, so it's not anymore a monarchy, you know, it comes from God, etc. No, it, it comes from, from citizens. So they accepted to have elections, but they said, oh, but there are dangers. They already saw dangers in, 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 in um, they spoke of, dem of demagogues. Uh, it's, it's, it was, in, in a way, it's when we say populism today and then demagogy, in, in the, that time there are some parallels there. So they saw the danger, you know, that the people might elect somebody like Trump, and then somebody like Trump can destroy the very institutions of democracy that gave him the power. And that's why the 
Americans introduced the whole idea of checks and balances. It has some sources also in the Montesquieu's idea of separation of powers, but checks and balances is also a little bit more complex in a way. It's not only separated powers, but they check each other, they control each other, keep, um, uh, and so that in the, in the end you have a balance. So it's not simply president who decides, no, you have a parliament. And then it's not simply parliament with one chamber, you have two chambers of parliament. So one chamber controls the other, the other. And then you have constitutional court, the supreme court, that can also uh, control to a certain extent what parliament does, because, and even president, etc., etc. So basically, I say, well, if you, you know, want to introduce direct democracy in a system of representative democracy that you already have, well, you know, of course, you also need checks and balances. You need some uh, ways to to um, to well to avoid uh, the risk of very bad decisions uh, taken through direct democracy. So you might decide to have a quorum. Quorum can mean different things. It can be quorum on turnout, like in Italy, 50% is needed in order for a referendum to be valid rather against it because it has some perverse effects that those who are against the referendum they don't go out and in the end, let's uh, develop this later if you, if, you, if you but you can also have a quorum on in the output you say in order to, to be valid no matter what turnout is you can even have 40% turnout let's say but the decision in order to be valid you must reach at least 55% or 60% not simply 50% plus one simple majority, but you need some qualified majority. For instance, you can say that. Uh, or you can discuss about compulsory voting in order to avoid that uh, that that when when turnout is very low, like 30 to 35 percent, that actually have a majority that decides, but that majority is a minority of the whole population. So you might say, okay, let's uh, uh, provide some incentives uh, for uh, to, so that people actually do go out and vote, uh, so you introduce compulsory voting. And I say compulsory, it's not that you put people in jail and they don't vote, but you, they, they, they have to pay some, let's say, five euro uh, um, if, they, if they decide not to vote. Uh, then you might decide to have judicial review of, of uh, popular initiatives so before coming, actually even before starting collecting signatures, the text of the initiatives, you, might, you could you know, introduce this should be uh, validated by a constitutional court to say whether or not uh, this is in, in accordance with the existing laws or international treaties, fundamental human rights, etc., etc. And in addition, you can add something more in the system, and I will conclude on that, which is the use of mini-publics, so-called mini-publics. And this is, the, 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 as I call it, the Oregon model, because I think it's interesting for many reasons. It makes direct democracy even more deliberative, but also it can also be, but that's a hypothesis, we still have to check it empirically, it can also have uh, um, some, um, yeah, this non-enabling function towards populism, if you have many publics. So what I mean when I say many publics, again, you might have read about it, you might have already have some, I don't know, uh, lessons about uh, mini publics. Uh, they are sometimes also called citizens assemblies. What is here important is how they are selected. They are selected by lot or by sortition, or random sample. Uh, you've had, a, we've had a lot of uh, citizens assemblies in the past uh, 10, 20 years, every year more and more. Uh, in many countries, actually, I'm not sure about Portugal. I still haven't checked that. No, not that you know, or you say no, okay? Uh, but you've had in in, 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 I mean, in Belgium, in Ireland, in Canada, in the United States, in Germany, in France. Uh, President Macron la launched uh, well two three years ago this uh, Convention Citoyenne pour le Climat, which is a citizens' assembly on climate change. 150 randomly selected French citizens discussing about climate change. They proposed 151 measures, um, 
many of them have not been implemented, uh, but it seems that uh, Macron and his government uh, are trying to implement at least some of them, at least, et cetera, et cetera. So there was a bigger discussion about you know, what to do with the result of, a, of this mini public uh, citizens' assembly. Uh, but so there are many models of uh, mini publics or citizens' assemblies. But I focus here on this Oregon so-called Citizens Initiative Review model, which is something that was introduced in 2006 or 8 in Oregon. Citizens Initiative Review, what is it about? It, citizens initiatives that are reviewed uh, by a panel of um, a mini public of 20 to 25 uh, randomly selected citizens of Oregon. And it's interesting also because it is connected to direct democracy, as I will show in a minute. So this is a, an example of such mini public, which is actually the first mini public that uh, we organize in Switzerland, um, myself and my team, with, within this project actually. We had some money within the research project to, to, to do this first pilot in Switzerland in 2019 in a city of Sion, about 30,000 people. And these are uh, 20 randomly selected citizens who discussed the topic of affordable housing. Because it, there was a, a, a popular initiative and a popular vote at the federal level in Switzerland demanding for more affordable housing. And, and this citizen panel, as we call them, uh, met about three months earlier to discuss about the topic. Uh, so, so, so yeah, yeah, let me say more about that. So they, they discuss about the topic during uh, four days, typically during two weekends. They have the possibility to ask questions to experts. There are a couple of meetings with experts. Experts must be neutral in the way how they answer the questions without you know, showing what is their preference, whether to vote yes or no. Then they meet with stakeholders, and actually these are here, these two people are stakeholders. The woman on the left is a woman from, a, uh, from an organization that actually had launched this popular initiative. It's, a, it's, a, it's an association that protects the interests of, uh, of uh, those who rent apartments. Uh, it's a quite powerful organization. So they collected uh, signatures, and so she was in favor of the initiative. And the guy on the right is from the Chambre Immobilière. I don't know how to translate this from, from, the, from those who, uh, who own houses, uh, house owners uh, association, who was against the initiative. And so this was the moment when this citizen panel was asking questions, and actually they also had some debate in order to hear okay, what are the arguments from one side and the other side. And in the end, of the fourth day, they write a, a short one to two page summary of the, like, what is the initiative about, and then saying, okay, these are three main claims that we have checked, in, so again, fake news, huh? we check that these are true information, and these are the three main reasons to vote yes, and these are the three main reasons to vote no, in this referendum. And then this citizen's statement is sent out to all voters. Well, this was a federal initiative, so, and this was a scientific experiment, <laughs> if you want, in a way, but, you know, a, a real-world uh, experiment. Because the, 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 it was a federal popular initiative, we should have sent, you know, to all voters in Switzerland this statement. But, you know, five million voters, you can imagine the cost. Uh, Within this pilot, the statement was sent to, to 20,000 people in the city of Sion who have the right to vote. So it was within municipality. Uh, so these people who were from that municipality, their report was sent to the voters, to all voters uh, ahead of the popular vote, uh, to all voters of that municipality. And of course, it was available internet, etc. Uh, and and the idea is that. Uh, uh, voters can have not only the opinion of the authorities, of political parties, etc., but they can also have opinion of ordinary citizens. What do they think about that initiative? 
And I see in these mini publics uh, a non populist potential in connection with direct democracy because there is some empirical evidence that uh, in mini publics there is a shift of opinion and attitudes, meaning that people who come to mini public either they have no idea, actually, most people in our mini public did not know about this initiative. What, would they you know, vote yes or no? They said, oh, I, they didn't have an a priori opinion, but some of them did. And so you, you, during the four days, you have a shift of opinions because you know they learn more about initiative, they, they listen to different uh, experts, to stakeholders, etc., etc. And, uh, and we do have empirical, uh, some empirical evidence that many publics that have the topic is something, you know, populist proposal. Uh, that at the beginning, you might have within the mini public a majority that is in favor of that populist proposal. Like there was one, there was one empirical study on a Swiss referendum which was on the expulsion of foreign criminals, uh, criminals who don't have Swiss nationalities, but they are you know, convicted of crime. And uh, you can say this is a populist proposal. You know, let's you know, kick out all foreigners who are criminals from our country. And empirical evidence shows that at day one, you might have a majority of this mini public which is representative of the population that is in favor of such a proposal. But after four days of listening to different arguments, deliberating among themselves, etc., you usually have only at the end only a minority that favors such a populist proposal. And so it is now a really open question because we need more such mini publics, more testing, empirical work, etc., to see whether these mini publics can then have a, a non populist potential towards the wider public, the people who vote in the referendum. Because hypothesis is that if voters follow the recommendations of this CIR, this Oregon model of mini public, then there is a risk, there is less risk of populist uh, decisions. The question is, of course, well, will voters follow what mini public, you know, this statement of mini public? Well, some empirical evidence from Oregon says that there is a relatively high percentage of voters who say that they do read this statement and they take it into account when, when, when they vote, they find, they find it also helpful. Uh, this, this is, uh, using such statements is typically said it's, it's a shortcut for voters to make a decision, which means they don't need to read everything, the whole, you know, uh, citizens' initiative, which is sometimes also very compl complicated. They, you know, they use a shortcut, which can be, you know, I, I listen to what my party says about that, but, you know, they also can use this shortcut. And, again, hypothesis is that precisely those citizens who are against the elites, they don't, almost by definition, they don't trust the established parties, the government, etc. And so they might not, you know, be interested, not even at reading what comes from the government or from the parties. But again, hypothesis is that these citizens, or at least some of them, might be more interesting, interested to read what the citizen's statement is, what ordinary citizens, people like themselves, have said about a given issue. So that would be everything.